just after stage four of the tour down under and I'm talking with James Wheeler. In stage three, he put on an amazing display which basically confirmed him to be one of the riders of the next generation of Australian pro cyclists. What we saw from you was an amazing display. Did it feel that way for you? I just felt like I did my job of the day. Um, basically, I was just told what to do through the radio and I had the legs to be able to pull it off, um, which I think was um, a surprise to Tom. He thought that I would just be pretty stuffed by the time we got to the circuits. Um, Tom, South. Tom Southam being the DS, yeah. And um, yeah, I was pretty stoked to be able to race from the front of the race. Um, and when I got the all clear in the breakaway with about three laps to go to start to go hard up the climbs and get rid of the dead weight of the breakaway, it was um, it was nice to be able to see how the legs were and um, and then also for Alberto to come across um, and then to realise that he was the only one with legs left in that group as well and then we were able to go away in a bit of a duo attack was, was really cool and also it's exciting for the team oh, yeah. as well. Um, the staff got an absolute buzz out of it and all the fans I think liked it and, and uh, my family, my sisters in particular, um, came and watched which is pretty rare for a bike race. Um, I think it was my sister's first bike race that she's come and watched, my younger sister. I think we did a pretty good job um, as a team and it was everything that we discussed um, in the team meeting before breakfast so happy days. Yeah. I can understand why the team was excited, I mean you've launched a new kit, you've got new bike yeah. steam, new yeah. font on the Cannondale, all sorts yeah, of different yeah. things, we know about the Rafa connection but the, the aesthetic was quite quite special yeah you know and yeah. it certainly showed that EF education first done a great job with their design with Rafa mm. but what was uh, for me the most noticeable is that you seem to be pedaling about two uh, rotations to every one of Alberto's would you say that your cadence was that high yeah it was pretty high I was actually I didn't realize I mean I've got a bit of a reputation to, to spin a lot um, particularly in that situation high speed mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I was looking at the replay um, after dinner and I did notice that I was probably doing about 125. Um, but for me, that feels normal. Um, and for me, often, yeah, it's just a way of me saving my legs. Um, but yeah, I don't know. When, I, when you compare it to Alberto's, definitely I look like I was, uh, I don't know, running like junior gears or something. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, you're not really long off junior gears, but you probably mm -hmm. never even raced them because mm -hmm. yeah. you're really new to cycling. Right? Yeah. Let's delve into that back. I'm hearing different stories about how you came to the sport and mm. your evolution as a, as a runner into it and then the progression into cycling. Yeah. But going on what I saw yesterday, it looked like you were born on a bike. Talk me through yeah. the sequence of yeah, how you yeah. got to be a, a pro cyclist in the yeah. world tour. Yeah, well, basically, uh, halfway through 2016, I two things happened with, with my running. I, I, I began to lose the fire for, for training and the motivation to be, become a semi-professional runner domestically in Australia. And then that also came in time with um, an Achilles injury um, just before the Nationals in March that year. And so I decided to have some time away from sport and then... Uh, my old man got me onto a bike because he realised that I was agitated because I wasn't exercising. And after... And how old were you at that point? So I would have been 19. Okay. Um, uh, 19, 20, 20, yeah. And so, and I was also doing uni as well. Um, and then I started just racing the local crits because they were close by the Q criterium at the Hawthorne Cycling Club. And then uh, I was actually on par with some of the NRS riders um, with with little training, basically just my fitness from running. Um, cardiovascular I was fine, but my legs didn't have the strength and or the endurance. Um, but I guess the first breakthrough was the Tour of Tasmania. Um, and then that led on to a pretty uh, successful Australian summer, which then led on to my first European stint, which was also successful and uh, it all sort of just went from there. Um, yeah, so the first year of cycling, not a whole lot happened. I got a knee injury for, for four months. I had tendonitis, so I missed out. That was after Oceania's. And then basically I reset and had that eight-month uh, eight block of, of, of good races, good results, and um, I got a bit of interest and 
managed to get the start at the Flanders race with the Australian team and obviously that was a, a massive breakthrough win for me um, and that essentially punched my ticket to um, where I am now. Um, okay. Then I guess that's that's down to Drapak, um, Michael Drapak getting me on board with the team and really helping me out there and um, yeah, I'm pretty fortunate to be in the position I am because there's plenty of riders who domestically are perhaps like as talented as I am, but I've just managed to be able to go through the system really cleanly. And so I've, I consider myself pretty lucky. Two and a half years ago, I was running a Mexican restaurant, uh, Fonda Mexican, I'm not sure if you know it, oh. but I was running the kitchen there, 12 man kitchen. And if someone had told me then that I'd be racing the Tour Down Under and racing it reasonably competitively, I would have told them they're dreaming, to be honest. Okay. Um, but I don't know, I guess I got pretty obsessed with, with bike riding and the idea of becoming a professional. Mm -hmm. um, and it just happened to be that um, I got the opportunities and then the results that that warranted that. So it's pretty pretty cool. Given the two, the rapid turnaround already, mm. do you set yourself lofty ambitions or do you just sort of I guess, wait to see what unfolds. How do you approach a season like this? I'm, I'm pretty... I try and dull it all down a little bit. Obviously, I can be super ambitious and say, I, you know, I want to be doing a grand tour this year and then trying to do well. But um, for me, my biggest priority is to remain healthy, to remain fit and to enjoy what I'm doing um, and then see how everything else pans. Now that I'm in the World Tour, I think my biggest responsibility with the team is to soak it all up um, as a Neo. And particularly being like only six months ago, I was the rookie amongst the under 23 riders. And now I'm like the rookie amongst pros. Like a lot of guys on the team um, in my, with, with EF, didn't, don't realize how green I am. Um, like when I went back to go get bottles, um, that was technically the first time I'd ever gone back to go get bottles. Oh wow! Um, and so just small things like that, because um, usually with with the races that I'd done, there was the feed zones, or we had the races were short enough that you could just carry what you had in your pockets. Okay. Um, so when I told Tom at the end of the the race um, on stage one that that was the first time I'd ever gone back to get to get bins for seven riders, he couldn't believe it and it was on that parachrome circuit okay. which was pretty sketchy so uh yeah I was trying to stay relaxed as possible but I was pretty nervous wow and yeah. so how was the experience like did you did you get through it did you sort yeah. of were you bumping the car <laughs> were you hitting the mirror were you yeah uh, fumbling the bottles what was how did it all unfold for you all well, the day before I was watching YouTube videos of guys doing it um just because I knew tomorrow I'm going to have to go back to the cars, go back through the convoy. You know, I was just watching guys, the way they put two bins in their back pockets and then that then keeps the bins from falling down back through their pockets. Just small things like that. Um, and then I just basically tried to mimic um, when I was called back. When Tom, Tom was like over the radio, he was like, right, Jimmy, uh, bottles. And then I was like, casual, tried to be as casual as possible. I was like, yeah, sure, that's fine went back to the convoy and talk about, I don't know how long. Um, yeah, and I think Tom realized about halfway through me grabbing my fourth bottle that this was the first time I'd done it. But uh, I managed to get all the biddings to the riders. It's a like great, great success. Yeah. Um, and then... Uh, with, the, the, with the water warm by the time you got back or it was a quick uh, transaction I'll, afterwards? I wouldn't call it cold. <laughs> 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 um, and then that next lap, I had to grab a feed bag full of bins and I grabbed the top and then it wrapped around my hand and I couldn't get it off. And then we we're going through the parachrome circuits with the descents, with this holding this feed bag full of bins. Um, there's a funny photo uh, that Mary, the CEO of the team, took of me just going down this S bend and I'm holding this bin and uh, I've got like a broken finger from the crash at Nationals and one hand on the bars. It's a... Uh, it's quite the NeoPro photo. <laughs> but yeah, small things like that is actually quite a challenge at the moment. 
um, but I'm learning quickly, so yeah. Small things could become big things unless you mm, have absolutely. the right approach. Yeah, yeah. It's a dangerous situation if I can't grab the feedback properly. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm learning quickly. But I've had a great time over the last four days. Can we just backtrack a little and just consider your running? Mm. Because, I mean, I know that you basically, I know you're a runner. I yeah. don't know the distance. I don't yeah, know yeah. your achievements. I, would, I wouldn't say that I, with running, I, I didn't get bored. Mm. Um, but it was a combination of uh, I wasn't enjoying just... Uh, what I was getting out of running in terms of my goals as as a runner and it's really difficult to make uh, proper like you can't really support yourself being a semi-professional runner in Australia it's really difficult to and you have to be the best of the best especially when you're not a sprinter which yeah. I'm looking at you I'm which I'm yes. definitely definitely not okay. I'm, I, I would call myself a well if I can bet like a 1500 meter runner um, to 5k mm -hmm. um, and that's what I competed in uh, throughout school mm -hmm. um, and then when I was making that jump from junior to the elite category um, everyone has to make or the runners have to make that decision as to whether they want to make that jump and when you jump to the elite category it really is the highest standard mm -hmm. and I did make that commitment I wanted to say okay I'm going to try and get uh, Commonwealth Games qualifiers and I'm going to see if I can get really quick times and essentially race against um, the best Australian runners in 1500. Um, but that quickly, that motivation quickly fizzled out. And I guess I had to realize that and uh, when you're not enjoying what you're doing, particularly in, a, in such a hard sport, like, and it would be the same with bike riding, it's difficult to um, train as hard as you do. Um, and so I, I decided to call an end to it. Um, and, and that also had the Achilles injury as well. Um, and so that in itself meant I had, wouldn't, couldn't run for 18 months. But then bikes, bike riding came along and yeah, got pretty obs obsessed, as I said, with the idea of becoming a professional. But I was also just loving bike riding. All the bunch rides in Melbourne, all the crits. Yeah. Um, basically for the first year of riding, all I did was bunch rides and crits. I didn't do any sessions or anything, okay. um, but I just yeah made a lot of mates there, and uh, now I've got a good little following in Melbourne and a lot of mates to go back home to, on the bike. So um, it, was, it was more social than sporting, at, from the outset, or yeah, it was more of a social thing, yeah. um, for sure. I mean, at first I didn't have any bike friends, but that quickly changed when you were rocking up to crits regularly and and making like I just tried to be as outgoing as possible and. Um, but yeah, so I think I answered that one. I would say I have OCD. Okay, you would say that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we, do you mind if I talk about that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. And it's not a. It's not a bad yeah. phenomenon. It's a lot of people have it. I think if you find like one thing that I've noticed uh, throughout the last two years. Uh, I have a habit of listening to podcasts and whatnot um, about successful people and often very successful people are on the spectrum of you know that type of OCD, ADHD um, I think those people are just really good at honing in on what they want to do and sort of take away all the outside distractions people say, call, me, call myself uh, that I get tunnel vision um, so when I... Which is a compliment. Yeah, I, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That tunnel vision comes from Nick White. Okay. Um, he started that one. Um, and I guess I just uh, pull off all everything that's irrelevant to, um, to the life outside bike riding to a certain extent. Obviously, I have a fine balance. I understand that I've got schoolmates and university mates that I still catch up with. But I very much do everything to when I wake up, to when I go to bed, to try and be the best bike rider possible. And I had to do that in order to try and get up to the level that I needed to be by the time I'd finished under 23 category. So that's how I saw it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, 
yeah, I mean, I'm very particular in everything that I do. And I think you find that most good bike riders are um, really refined in what in their processes, mm -hmm. which you could then categorize into like a, an OCD type thing. Um, but that's not to say that um, I don't catch up with my schoolmates and stuff. Um, I think a that lot make of you an outcast by any no, no, yeah. So like most most bike riders, you would say are classically an introvert. Um, but I think I have like two parts of me. There's like the Jimmy that lives in Melbourne and has all his schoolmates and his running mates and catches up with all all those guys and tries to be have, have I try to find a balance between that and being a bike rider because obviously they clash so much mm. um, and it's really easy. Like I, you often see guys that just fully indulge into the bike riding life and don't. Um, find a healthy balance and they can burn out really easily and there's so many talented young Australians uh, currently and in the past who have just burnt out mm -hmm. and not enjoyed bike riding mm -hmm. so, I'm, so when I'm doing all this sacrifice and, and hard work I'm always trying to be self aware of that what I'm doing is, is perhaps somewhat extreme and that uh, um, I need to find a balance so I, th I was talking to Michael Woods about it and um, he was saying that an interesting thing that he said is that uh, usually the guys, like the top bike riders, are unhealthily fit, for example, um, just because they're so refined. And that's what you talk about when you're saying you want to get to the end of the season and basically be healthy. You mm. need to. Uh, I published a story with Ben O'Connor mm. or an interview and. I, I t touched on the, the possibility of him having eating disorders based on the discussion yeah. I had when yeah, absolutely. he signed his contract. Yeah. And he realised in the first month mm. that he was going down that route. Yeah, yeah. I, I read about that. And um, yeah. And he was really quite open about it. And he was sort of, I mean, it was clear relief. Like he was thrilled that I actually recognised that mm. enough to talk about it. Mm. Um, because, you know, bike riding is a wonderful thing to do, but when you were take it to the nth degree it can be yeah. quite treacherous it can be incredibly limiting yeah and i think you you look at it through november and december with the australian nationals and you see the the young under 23 riders and they get obsessed with diet mm -hmm. um and too obsessed and then they might have a bad nationals and then um for for whatever reason they might just tactically might have stuffed up the race and then that can be really difficult mentally on a, on a rider mm. particularly on a on a kid mm. um, but uh, yeah you have to just be incredibly self-aware of what you're doing and that bike riding is a really difficult sport and, and if you're going to be elite at it you have to do what's required oh yeah this is what Mike said to me the other day um, he said like there's the talent of, of having good legs and good cardiovascular system but the biggest talent is being able to do the right processes and have the right head um, to be a bike rider that's the talent in itself um, so when he says someone is talented, he's always referring to them having a good head. Okay. Um, and Mike, uh, one thing I've learned from Mike is that he he ticks all the boxes. Um, he's as much a he's as genetically gifted as he is. Um, I don't know the word. Emotionally. Yeah, emotionally just switched on and always reading about stuff. And he's very well educated mm. from both sides. He's always reading the for of the article and the against and then he evaluates it and then makes his own opinion of it and I think that's important because um, he's telling me that people will give me a lot of advice over the next few years the crazy amounts and then I should just pick parts that I think are relevant and appreciate that they're giving me advice and um, to learn from that obviously I can't soak everything in and it's really important for me to understand that what I do take in is correct for my circumstance anyway um, because being the, the the rookie, everyone's going to give me tips, yeah, yeah. which is good, um, and it means people just want to take care of me. But um, yeah, I've got to be careful with what I do and don't do. I know you've had contact with Gerard Toey, for example, who was part of the infrastructure that Drapak mm. had put in place. Yeah, and he uh, talks a lot. Basically, his job is to try and prepare you, the very neo-pro, mm. 
to be now thinking about what comes in uh, 10, yeah. 15 years' time. Yeah. yeah. And it's even just having that, that thought bubble in your head helps, surely, or not? Yeah, it definitely does. I think my biggest strength is that I've been able to have that security of having a degree almost behind me. I've got three subjects left. Because okay. um, everyone says, like at best, you could be a professional bike rider for what, 10 years maybe. It's pretty good innings. Um, but uh, yeah, what do you do for the rest of your life? It's, um, it can be all... Tell stories about the glory days. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But in, in reality, you kind of, uh, you're out of the system if you're not in it pretty quick. Because other, otherwise you can finish your career and, and you might be wanting to get a contract that next year and you can be in, in quite a dark space if you're not ready to bounce out of it. Um, and that's where I'm lucky with, with Michael Drapak supporting the development team who then supports studying as well as bike riding. Um, and it, it's definitely a thing in a lot of sports now, but um, I'm glad that it's part of cycling now. Um, just because I think it's really easy for young bike riders to go over to Europe and give up everything and then come back at the age of 24 and not have anything going per se. Obviously they've had good experience and, and life opportunities, but um, you do need that career after bikes. Um, and in my case, I'm lucky to have that, that insurance, I guess. Some people know my story now get through various outlets, but um, I guess to, to junior riders or even to people that are making transition across the sport, to the sport, to cycling, so there is that opportunity to, to make it your job if you can, if you think you can fit, fit the bill and if you're prepared to do the right sacrifices and if you have the support network there. Um, and in my case, I was fortunate enough to, to be able to do that and manage to pull it off. So, um, I don't know, now I feel a responsibility to keep enjoying what I'm doing. Yeah. I feel like I've landed on gold, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty stoked with how life is traveling at the moment. Yeah. Um, I know I've, EF is keen to think outside the square. They don't need to necessarily yeah. do what's been done before and they're trying <laughs> to look at different initiatives. Yeah. Have, do, do they come to you and say, righto, Jimmy, what do you want to do in 2019? You've got some ambitious plans? Are you going to try and do something funky like Hawaii Ironman or God knows what? <laughs> no, well, well, I do still run. There's a bit of cross-training. Do you swim? I don't swim. Okay. So no Ironman, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Um, but, well, we've got the first proper team camp where everyone is together um, on the 14th of February. And so that goes for five days. Um, and all the riders will actually be there, so the Australian riders will be all together and um, I'm sure there will be a bit of discussion as to what the team goals are, individual riders and how it all sort of works together. Yeah. Because obviously from a media perspective, EF and, and the team have portrayed what they want to do with the team and, and, and the way they're going about things um, and I think they've done a pretty cool job with the way they've started. Mm. Um, but I think it'll be good. Um, once we get that training camp done to know how I fit in with the system as well um, and what the year entails outside of strictly my race calendar and I think that's what they're stressing mm -hmm. um, but so far it's been pretty cool um, I think I've just seen a great transition and the staff are really really happy um, with the new setup um, obviously a major sponsor is a massive deal um, particularly this year um, with bike riding um, and I think uh, to have EF who are so actively engaged with the cycling management and also just like the cycling world it's pretty cool and the way they're tying it in with um, their offices as well and it's kind of a perfect relationship in my opinion yeah and so it's pretty exciting to be on this team And so hopefully um, we'll see uh, I don't know, a few bucket hats on the podium, maybe. I wish you all the best for the, the rest of the year and yeah. the career that awaits you. <laughs> and um, I hope it goes the way that you see it unfolding. Yeah, thanks. Cheers. <laughs>